All right, gang, so uh, this is our unit that deals with really how things get in and out of cells. It's a little bit of cell physiology is really what we're talking about. Um, and we're uh, so focusing on how cells work. Right? And obviously, as you can kind of see here, um, what we're going to be talking about is cellular transport. Um, and really what it's all about is about how we get things in and out of cells. All right, so let's take a look at the, um, the very first picture here. Uh, we have is showing us a cell membrane. So remember that this cell membrane's got two layers, okay? And it's called a phospholipid bilayer. Um, and if we zoom in on it, um, and we'll actually we'll zoom in in a second, but let's talk about what um, cell membranes really do. Uh, so there are two big functions um, is that they control, A, they control what enters and exits the cells, so it provides homeostasis, right? So it controls how much glucose is inside versus outside. Uh, what's the concentration of uh, certain hormones or or um, or certain structures, amino acids, and things like that that you might need, okay? Um, and the other part is it provides protection and support for the cell. So um, it can, we can actually choose to keep things out. Um, we can... Um, uh, you know, generally it's difficult for most viruses or bacteria to get inside of cells. So, uh, so things along those lines, that's kind of what we're looking at. Now, when we zoom in and we actually look at a cell membrane, the structure of a cell membrane, it's a lipid bilayer. It's often referred to as a phospholipid bilayer, right? And the phospholipid kind of looks like this. It's got a head here, okay? And the phosphate head is polar. Um, which means it's water-loving. It mixes well with water. Hydrophilic, hydro, water, philic means it likes it, okay? Um, but then it's got these two tails that come down, so those two little tails there. Um, those tails, get rid of them so you can see the picture a little bit better. Um, those tails are nonpolar, so they're hydrophobic. So what happens um, in the last part of the plasma proteins, and you can see some of the plasma proteins right here, these little pink structures that are in the cell membrane. Okay? And you'll notice that if you take this and you drop it in there, it's actually a bilayer. The, these are the fatty heads on the outside, little dots around the outside, and then the little lines inside here, those are the tails that stick down. Here's a little bit more zoomed-in view of that. Um, so you can see the fatty heads around the outside. So you can see, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the polar heads around the outside, and then the fatty tails on the inside. And the same thing down here in this picture, just drawn a little bit differently. So you got the polar heads and the fatty tails. So we have water out here, and we have water here, both inside and outside of the cell. And, but we have this wall in between. Um, and what's really cool about the um, this cell membrane is it's actually fluid. There's no real bonds between these. So all that happens is these heads want to stay to the outside, the tails to the inside. So they move around. There's actually an animation here that I'll show you in, in class um, to kind of help you visualize this. But this is really a, a fluid um, that just maintains its structure by these tails trying to hide to the inside all the time and then the heads being on the outside all the time. So what we're going to focus on for the next 10 minutes or so is how things get through this cell membrane. How do we actually move stuff through this, right? So we've got this barrier uh, with mostly water on the outside, mostly water on the inside. Um, we've got these big protein channels here or doors and things like that. Um, and we want to talk about how things get in and out. So let's take a look at that right now. All right. So typically we break them up into two categories. We've got our passive, okay, passive mechanisms and active mechanisms. So the passive mechanisms... Um, think about like passive. So passive means kind of sit there, not do anything, you're not really exerting any energy, you're not really doing anything in the, in, in, in the process. Um, and that's really your defining characteristic is the cells don't use any energy for these. And when we say energy, remember we're talking ATP. So the cell doesn't need an ATP to do these things. Um, and it's often depicted like this. So you got a person on top of a hill here skating. See this little person up here skating? They don't have to put any energy in. They just roll down the hill, right? Okay. But active mechanisms do use ATP, and you can kind of visualize it as like a person having to work to go uphill. You're working up this, that's a whole lot of work, so this is going to be hard work, okay? Um, and they use energy, and usually, um, we'll show you why for, for a variety of reasons, but that's your, your big definition. Active uses ATP, passive does not use ATP. So our first passive mechanism is diffusion, okay? So diffusion. And um, I know you guys are familiar with diffusion, but we want to make sure that it's really clear here. So it's the movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So the molecules are moving from high to low. 
And the question that I always ask my kids is like, well, why, why does that happen? Okay. So really what it is, is remember that molecules are always moving. You should remember that from the chem class, that molecules are always moving. So see this like bunch of molecules right over here? They're always moving. Um, and what's going to happen is they're going to bounce off each other, and they bounce off each other, and they tend to spread out. Okay? And they don't stop moving, but they tend to spread out and get further away from each other. And the analogy I always use in class is I always say, imagine I took all of you guys into the corner of the room, and everybody put on blindfolds, and I told you guys to start swinging your arms around like crazy. Okay? Are you guys going to stay packed in this corner? No, you're going to hit each other. You get hit in the nose, you're all of a sudden start going to move this way away from it. And that's really what molecules do. They bounce. I bounce. Um, these molecules... These molecules right here, sorry for that delay, okay, these molecules bounce into each other, and when that one hits this one, it bounces off and goes in this direction. It goes to a spot, and then it'll hit that wall and bounce back, but it, it, they're just going to kind of bounce off each other, and because of that, they spread out, okay? And all of that is referred to as Brownian motion. So that fact that the molecules are always moving and bouncing off each other, that's referred to as Brownian motion, okay? So right here, Brownian motion. Um, and it's just a simple way of explaining why diffusion happens, okay? Um, I think you'll remember that you eventually will reach equilibrium, which means they're equally spaced out. So you can look at these molecules here, and they look pretty well equally spaced out. But remember, they still move around. They never stop moving unless we get to absolute zero, right? Um, and we're not getting to that. Um, so uh, they still move around, but what happens is we end up with something that's often referred to as dynamic equilibrium. Which all right, so the fact that these molecules, they're equally spaced out now, sorry, they're equally spaced out in this picture, but they never stop moving. We call that dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic means things are kind of changing. So the molecules are still moving around, moving around, but they're, they're now equally balanced. They call that dynamic equilibrium. All right, so our second passive mechanism is called facilitated diffusion. So it's still diffusion. That's the first first thing you want to keep an idea, uh, idea on. So it's still going to go from high to low. It still does not require ATP because it's passive. But what it does need now is proteins, okay, through the cell membrane. So this protein right here um, can be a protein door, a protein channel, a protein carrier. All of those are words we want to recognize as facilitated diffusion. So if you see channel, um, carrier, right down here, uh, if you just happen to see the word door, okay, you want to think passive transport facilitated diffusion. And all it is is in, in B here, um, uh, molecules could diffuse directly right through the membrane. That's plain old diffusion. But if they can't get through, a lot of molecules can't. So for instance, glucose can't get through a cell membrane by itself. It has to have a door for it to get through, and it comes right on through that little door, okay? Um, the other idea that you got to really understand with it is that this is very specific, okay? Um, specific, okay? So these doors are very specific. Only one molecule, one type of molecule goes through each of these doors. So if this is a glucose door, only glucose goes through. Calcium can't go through there. Nothing else can go through there. So we have a lot of these doors. And in fact, roughly about half of a cell membrane is made up of all of these different protein doors all over the surface. So going back to our earlier picture, here's one of those protein doors right here, and here's another one, and here's another one, and each of these can actually uh, let a different, a different type of molecule in through there. So again, the only difference between facilitated diffusion and plain old regular diffusion is the fact that we use these specific protein doors or channels or carriers to let stuff through there. And the third one is osmosis. So osmosis is just the diffusion of water. So the word diffusion means high to low, moving from high to low. Um, and uh, it's so important that it gets its own term. It's just the diffusion of water going from high concentration to low concentration, but it's so important um, that we get its own, it gets its own set of vocab. So when we talk about osmosis, we need to understand this set of vocab here. Okay, so solvent versus solute, two very commonly uh, uh, confused terms, okay? So solvent is like the liquid. So in this case, it's going to be the water. When we're talking about osmosis, this is the water, okay? And then the solute is whatever is dissolved in there. So if we're talking about sugar water, um, uh, if we're talking about salt water, whatever it is, so in this case, we'll call it salt water. So you put some NaCl in there, um, and that's the solute. So the solvent is what is the, the liquid portion of the part that's doing the dissolving, and the solute is what's dissolved. Okay? Now these three terms down here, hypertonic and hypotonic and isotonic, have to do with the solutions. Okay? So hyper 
means more, hypo means less, iso means same. So hyper, elevated, more, hypo is less, iso means the same, okay? Um, so what they're saying is, uh, they're talking about the relative amount of solvent and solute to two solutions you're comparing to another solution, okay? So a hypertonic solution has more solute. So it's got more stuff dissolved in it. And that bothers a lot of students because they think we're talking about water here. So they're expecting it to have more water, but it's actually more stuff dissolved in it. So it actually has less water, okay? Obviously, this would then, hypo is going to have less solute. And then the same amount of solute for an isotonic solution, okay? Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at. Uh, the little way I've always kept this straight in my head is I always do this, and it's really stupid and really silly, but hopefully you'll bear with me. So I always remember this, hypotonic. So if you look at that O, right, the middle of it's empty, okay? And in this case, hypotonic um, has less stuff dissolved in it, right? So it's kind of empty water. It doesn't have anything in it. And it's a silly, stupid little thing, but it always worked for me. Maybe it'll work for you. Our last passive mechanism is filtration. So filtration is a really simple idea. It's actually pressure forcing things through, and it's the, the most easy, the most common example is like your blood pressure forces water through the cell membranes of your capillaries. Um, it forces the plasma out, so your, your capillaries leak all the time. But it's just pressure forcing it through. It's not really a, a good or bad thing. It's just blood pressure doing it, so you're not using any ATP in this case. Um, it's just leaking out. All right, so now we're moving on to our active mechanisms. So active versus passive. So the active mechanisms, remember that they're going to use energy. Uh, again, a, a, uh, the energy is going to be ATP. Um, and we're going to be actively moving molecules to where they are needed. So this is going to be, it takes energy, so we don't do this without a reason. So um, this is going to be more a purposeful movement of molecules than just the random movement of molecules like diffusion, okay? And typically... Uh, the reason it takes ATP is because we're going to go from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So it's the opposite of where things want to diffuse. If you've got to push people, so imagine that analogy I said with you guys. You guys are all in the corner of the room, blindfolded. You guys start flailing your arms around. You guys want to spread out, right? It would require a lot of energy from me to keep shoving you back into the corner. If you guys tried to spread out, if I had to take you from that area of low concentration and then shove you back into that corner, you guys are going to fight against me. You're going to resist. That's what molecules do. They want to spread out, um, so it takes energy to make them go in that direction. All right, so the most famous uh, example of, active, of an active mechanism is called active transport, nicely named for us, right? So uh, remember, that means it uses ATP. And in this case, what we're going to use is use specific protein pumps. Remember, with facilitated diffusion, we said they're protein channels, protein doors, protein carriers. In this case, anytime you see this word pump, you're going to immediately think, active transport. We're using energy to shove something. Pumps shove things. They don't just let things pass through them. They're shoving things in the, in the direction you want them to go, okay? Um, so they use energy. They go from low to high. Um, and the most famous example is called the sodium potassium pump. The sodium potassium pump is what, what allows our nerves to work. We're going to talk a lot about those later in the year, um, but there's lots of examples like this, okay? Um, there are a couple little special categories of the sodium potassium pump, of, of, sorry, of active transport, um, and they're called co-transport and counter-transport. So co-transport, um, imagine this pump right here. Um, imagine that it is going to, imagine that it is going to pump two molecules, okay? If it were to pump two molecules in the exact same direction, we call it co-transport. So if it pumped this yellow one this way, and this red one in this direction, that would be called co-transport, and it's using ATP to shove them that way. However, if it did it in the exact, if it pumped two things in opposite directions, so imagine we're going to pump this red one in this direction, but this yellow one in this direction, now it's called counter-transport, okay? Um, and that's just two little separate side divisions of active transport. Our next act, um, active mechanism is called endocytosis, and endocytosis is when the cell really swallows something up. So the best picture I have of it is this one here. So imagine we got this big molecule here, uh, something that won't fit through a protein door, won't, won't get into the cell in any other way. Um, and what the, the cell membrane does, that cell membrane actually kind of folds around it and grabs hold of it. You can kind of see it right here, kind of grabbing hold of it. 
um, and then kind of pulls it right inside. So, um, so it's like literally it's like a, a, um, a cell membrane swallowing or eating up some large substance, okay? If it's a solid thing that it eats up, it's called phagocytosis, and that's a word we're going to use a lot this year, phagocytosis, because that's what white blood cells do. Um, they swallow up bacteria, viruses, um, and to get rid of them and remove them. Uh, and if it's a liquid, it's called penocytosis. We won't really use that vocab much this year, but thought it was important enough to throw at you. Okay? So that's swallowing things up. If we do the exact opposite, we spit out large things, we call that exocytosis. Okay? So in exocytosis, this whole chunk here, so say this is um, the waste products uh, from something, this whole thing can kind of move to the edge and then just literally spit out all of this little bit of this chunk, okay? It's how we actually release neurotransmitters in your brain. Um, that's how we release a lot of hormones, as you can kind of see here. So there's lots of examples of it, but it's, it's this cell membrane spitting out a big bulk of stuff versus little pieces um, at a time, right? And those are our uh, types of transport, guys. So I'll just use this page to really quickly recap, okay? So passive mechanisms, remember passive means no ATP is needed, no energy is needed. We've got diffusion, where molecules are just moving from high to low, just spreading out, okay? Um, facilitated diffusion, when where molecules are spreading out, but they need a protein door, um, a specific protein door or channel or carrier for the molecules to get through. Osmosis, just the diffusion of water. It's got its own special vocab, the hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic. You'll want to make sure we learn. We're going to do a little osmosis lab. I'll take care of you there. And then filtration is pressure, pushing things through. So those are our passive mechanisms. And then down here, we've got our active mechanisms where they do need to use ATP. Um, and the most common one is called active transport, and it uses a protein pump to shove things from low to high. So going in this direction from low to high. Um, and then endocytosis, where, where the cell is swallowing up some big, large chunk of something, uh, whether it be a bacteria or a virus, whatever it's swallowing up. And then exocytosis, when the, when the cell is spitting out a large amount of stuff. Um, and the, most, the one we'll talk about the most this year is neurotransmitters. When, you're, when your neurons communicate from one to the other, they spit out a whole bunch of these chemicals called neurotransmitters through the process of exocytosis. So I hope that works well. Um, tomorrow what I'll do is I'll go back in within this PowerPoint. There's a whole bunch of cool little videos to help visualize it. So we'll start off class with that, run through, make sure that you guys uh, see it, and then we'll, we'll work our way through it. Um, remember, hopefully anything you circled, come see me with questions.